Uh, my name is Professor Elsenlein Kingma. I'm Sarabi Chair of the Philosophy and Medicine Project at King's College London. I'm actually very excited because I'm in my new office for the first time ever. And indeed in an office for the first time in well over a year. So, you know, there it is. Uh, different from my home background. I'll just say something very briefly about the Sarabi Philosophy and Medicine Project. Uh, and the series we're running today, and then I'll introduce um, our chair, who will introduce our speaker. So, on the Sowerby Philosophy Medicine Project, this project is generously funded by the Peter Sowerby Foundation, for which we're very grateful, and it's based at King's College London. We're a group of philosophers working in areas of philosophy with impact, application, and significance to medicine, nursing, or midwifery. One of our primary aims of the project is to provide philosophical training to future doctors on issues such as the topic of our series today. Issues that require the clear, regular, vigorous and analytic thinking that is the primary tool and offering of philosophy. More generally in this, <clears throat> I'm having real trouble today talking. More generally, however, uh, our aim is to expand the conversation between philosophy and medicine that involves engaging philosophers on questions, ethical, political, epistemological, metaphysical, et cetera, of real relevance to doctors, nurses, midwives, and health professionals. And also engaging healthcare workers and patients in a philosophical process of determining what these relevant questions and the medical parameters should be. So this is why we are so delighted today uh, that I can introduce our chair, Haris Schweib, who will be chairing our talk. Because Haris is the London AI Centre Transformation Lead and Consultant Clinical Scientist at Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. The London Medical Imaging and AI Centre for Value-Based healthcare, healthcare is a consortium of academic NHS and industry partners that work to discover, develop and deliver pioneering AI technology for the NHS. Um, for our international audience, the NHS, of course, is the UK's celebrated national health service. It is led by King's College London and based at St. Thomas's Hospital. And it was recently awarded a £16 million uh, pound DHSC grant by the Office for Life Sciences to enable a programme of artificial intelligence research within the NHS to provide more innovative and accessible healthcare solutions to the public. Now, before we kick off, a few logistical notes. Uh, about uh, today's event. The talk, but not the Q&A portion, will be recorded and posted on our website and YouTube channel. The links to this you will find in the chat. Ticket holders to our events will also be notified once these recorded videos become available. You're also very welcome to sign up to our project's newsletter or to follow us on social media. Links to both, again, have been posted in the chat. Sorry, uh, Dr. Creel's talk will take between 45 to 60 minutes and then we'll take a five minute break to stretch, grab a refreshment and collect our thoughts. At that point, uh, Haris will chair the Q&A session and have a first crack at questions, if he so wishes. Um, and Winnie Ma, who is the project manager, will close us off because I'm really sorry, but I will have to leave um, before the end due to personal reasons. Uh, so with that, I want to uh, warmly uh, thank, uh, because I won't have uh, the ability to do this afterwards, I want to warmly thank our speaker, Katie Creel, in advance for joining us, and our chair, uh, Haris Swaib, uh, for joining us as well. And Haris, I hereby hand over to you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for giving me uh, the honor to, to host uh, today's session. Um, I have the honour and delight to introduce Dr. Katie Creel. Um, Dr. Creel is the Embedded Ethics Fellow at, at Stanford University. She's based in the Centre for Ethics in Society and the Institute for Human-Centred Artificial Intelligence, whose purpose is to advance AI research, education, policy and practice to improve the human condition. Dr. Creel's current research explores the moral, political and epistemic implications of machine learning as it is used in non-state automated decision-making and in science. She also has other ongoing projects on early modern philosophy and general philosophy of science. And today, um, as you hopefully know, she's going to give an excitingly titled talk, Let's Ask the Patient, 
stereotypes, personalization, and risk in medical AI. Over to you, Katie. Thanks so much for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you for hosting this event. And uh, I'm, I've already seen uh, one fantastic talk in this series, and I encourage everyone to uh, catch the whole series. It's, it's really going to be an exciting group of speakers that I think builds on each other really well, which is thanks to Winnie's curation. Um, so let me get started here. Uh, so when we think about medical decision making and automated uh, diagnosis, we, we want to think about it as something new, something exciting. But we know, in fact, that it builds on an extremely long tradition of non-AI based medical decision to support calculators. So we can think of this as algorithms that just don't happen to use artificial intelligence. Um, and almost every part of clinical practice has algorithms like this. So I'll just briefly walk you through a simple one. Um, so there's this, this clinical question, right? If someone has had a, a C-section, a cesarean operation, um, but now is considering a vaginal birth, is that going to be safe? Or do they need to have a second C-section? So there's this really standard score, VBAC, uh, that attempts to calculate how safe this will be. And you put in a bunch of stuff, which I'll show you, um, and you get this predicted chance of successful vaginal birth after cesarean for the patient, uh, given the kinds of information you gave it. So what goes into it? Maternal age, height, pre-pregnancy weight, uh, whether you've previously done this thing, um, and then a couple different um, other medical indicators that might make you at higher risk. Um, currently, one of them includes being whether you've been previously treated for chronic hypertension. But this is actually quite recent. In the past, instead of that indicator, uh, this algorithm used the race of the patient. So the history here is that the VBAC calculator used to assign a lower likelihood of success uh, with vaginal birth after C-section to African-American and Hispanic women. Um, in 2017, Vias and colleagues challenged the use of race in this calculator, arguing that um, the way the score was calculated made it such that African-American and Hispanic people uh, were considered less likely to be able to have a successful vaginal birth. And so since they were discouraged from doing so, this ended up meaning that they had more C-sections and therefore more complications from C-sections. And so in 2021, the calculator was updated to remove race. And instead, we substituted this uh, other variable, which was a prior treatment for chronic hypertension. So one of the things that I want to look at in this first half of the talk is this question of um, race as it's used in statistical generalizations. And when uh, it's a poor proxy, um, how do we use machine learning to find uh, a better proxy when that's possible? Because I think sometimes this question that this, uh, one of the questions that this series is addressed can be misframed as a trade-off. So the trade-off is often framed as either we use statistical data to generate predictions about individuals relying on categories like race in hopes of improving the clinical outcomes. Um, and maybe that helps, but on the other hand, maybe that's a stereotype, maybe that diminishes clinical outcome, maybe it ends up compounding injustice. Um, instead of thinking about it in, in this type of trade-off, I'm gonna propose thinking about uh, finer grained and in many cases more personalized to the patient uh, variables that have more predictive success. So the outline for my talk is um, what I just said. In many cases, race-based statistical generalizations will be less predictive than using the causal factors for which race is functioning as the proxy. Um, machine learning, interestingly, can help us sometimes find those more predictive factors, or when they're not available, it can help us find the relevant subgroups um, or intersectional categories that are more predictive than race, which is often too coarse grained to be a good uh, variable for clinical alg algorithms like this. Um, but then I'm going to introduce a second angle on the problem, which is that if machine learning is being used for diagnosis, if it's being used as a, a second opinion, 
it will not only need to predict, which is the, the angle that we often think about in terms of using race in clinical algorithms, but it'll also need to balance competing risks of false positives and false negatives. And these kind of choices between competing risks should rely on the patient's own values and own tolerances for risk, which machine learning can incorporate in making these kinds of diagnostic recommendations. So I'm gonna argue that this would be better than introducing a new form of automated statistical generalization that's based on values. Okay, so let's do a little uh, context for medical AI. So the first kind of case I'm gonna look at is AI for perceptual tasks. Um, so AI and especially deep learning are often used for what we might think of as, as substitutes for some sort of cognitive act of perception by a radiologist, by a clinician. You know, we look at something, we look at a scan, and we try to identify what we're seeing. So we can use it to detect cancerous growths, detect abdominal aortic aneurysms, that kind of thing. Um, this has really caught on. In 2015, no radiologist survey used AI for these kinds of tasks. And in 2020, at least in the US, 30% of them did. I want to apologize, by the way, almost all of my examples are US-based. I'm just sorry. It's not good, but <laughs> that's what I've got. Um, OK, so sometimes when we think about the so-called success of AI, as in the little sketch that I just gave, um, it's tempting to frame it as sort of an adversarial evaluation of the AI pitted against the clinician. Who's going to be better? How, how can we figure out, you know, when is AI going to surpass radiologists and put them all out of jobs? Um, I think in the last five years, we've really seen that this is not an accurate framing of how uh, diagnostic and predictive AI is actually used in clinical settings. Um, so in these trials that, that get the sort of splashy headlines that are like, AI is surpassing radiologists, you know, you often have a very artificial context where AI is diagnosing based on these training on data labeled by human clinicians, but then the human clinicians against which they're compared uh, don't get to do their sort of normal, um, in their normal ecological setting, the kind of diagnosis that they would do where they get to um, talk to people, talk to the patients, run more tests, whatever. They're just sort of given the scan absolutely uh, contextless and asked to perform this task. So in a lot of cases, what seems like the AI doing better is actually not really ecologically valid in terms of how this would appear in a normal context. But that's fine because this is not actually the question that we have to resolve. Uh, AI is not replacing radiologists. Instead, it's assisting diagnosis. So um, the way it typically works is that the doctor will form a clinical judgment um, and sort of a confidence evaluation of their judgment. And they'll use AI as sort of a second opinion. Um, and depending on their confidence in their initial opinion, they'll, they'll put more or less weight in the AI diagnosis. Um, interestingly, junior clinicians tend to overweight AI diagnosis and senior clinicians uh, tend to underweight it, but we won't get into that. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so when we're thinking about uh, bias, we can think about two kinds of bias uh, in, in this loop that I've sketched. Um, so one, of course, is uh, how might bias affect how clinicians differentially take up statistical judgments? So there have um, not been a lot of studies on this at all, uh, but when we look at how judges interpret um, risk scores in uh, sentencing, which is obviously quite different, but just to give you an example of the kind of thing that we might be interested in testing for in the future, um, judges given the same risk score for uh, people who have been sentenced and the judges are trying to figure out, should we release these people? Are they uh, potentially a safety risk to the community? Uh, judges will tend to take risk score for white defendants at face value, but think that risk scores for black defendants are understating it and so bump them up. So I think there's a lot that we don't know about how this loop is gonna work in sort of the clinical context. And that's gonna be an interesting area for further research. But we do know more 
about um, sort of the, the bias that might be directly in uh, the AI and how that might degrade clinical judgment. And so one of the things that people talk about that's relevant for the theme of this series is, is it better for the AI to be aware or unaware of factors such as race? So should we include race as a variable? Should we include it in the training data? Um, is it better to have awareness or is it better to have unawareness? What's gonna produce more equitable outcomes? So let's just take a little brief tour through racial bias in computer vision and medical AI for perceptual tasks. So a lot of um, tools that have been used as benchmarks or calibrations throughout the history of imaging in the broadest possible sense uh, have been biased towards majority or dominant social groups. So there's this thing called the Shirley card, which was what film developers used as a test image in order to make sure that the balance of their chemicals were right. Originally, the Shirley card only included a white woman. The woman included on the left or other, other women um, on various different manufacturers' Shirley cards. Uh, only much later did they include darker skin tones. So the film development was optimized for white skin tones specifically and often didn't show darker skin tones as well. So we see uh, a similar thing in the major image recognition um, databases like ImageNet. So ImageNet is the sort of huge canonical labeled data set that a lot of people use to train computer vision algorithms. Um, it has 22,000 categories. It has 14 million images. Uh, each of these images has been labeled by a person with what it contains. Um, and interestingly, the, the challenge itself uh, is even, even more targeted. And we know that ImageNet is biased in a variety of ways. So when we use the word bias, there are two different senses of bias. So one is just sort of a, a morally neutral sense of bias in the sense of, you know, what is it uh, better at detecting? So one bias is that it's biased towards texture. So if you look at these images, which are sometimes called natural adversarial examples, they're real images, um, but they are very confusing to any uh, classifier that's been trained on ImageNet. Um, and so if you look at the image on the left, um, it's actually supposed to be a fox squirrel, but it gets classified with high probability as a sea lion. If you look at the image on the right, uh, it's supposed to be a dragonfly, but it's classified with high probability as a manhole cover. And the reason for that is that those things have this texture, either the texture of sort of smooth, dark wetness or the texture of this cross hatching that's on manhole covers, at least in the US. Um, and so that texture overrides what, you know, a human being might naturally focus on, which is, you know, the, the living being in the center of the image. So that's kind of a neutral bias that's in ImageNet. But there's also uh, the more traditional sense of bias in a colloquial sense, which is that it overrepresents males, light-skinned peoples, and adults between the age of 18 and 40. And this has sort of predictable results for uh, the classifiers that train on ImageNet in the sense that because those uh, faces are so underrepresented um, and so undersampled in the image databases, the classification ends up being less successful. So there's been a huge improvement in facial recognition data sets, especially since 2014. Some great activism has led to uh, both the original data sets improving and additional uh, data sets being added that are more representative. Uh, but we're not focusing on that. We're focusing on medical AI. So where does the bias in AI for medical imaging come from? Well, um, in order to understand that, let's think just briefly about um, what kind of mistakes AI can make in general. So one of the classic mistakes um, is overfitting or failure to generalize. So there was a, a great case where um, a medical imaging AI had been trained to diagnose pneumonia in lung x-rays. And uh, it seemed to be pretty successful at that. But then it turned out that there were actually two types of lung x-rays in the studies. 
One was taken in the hospital and one was taken by the portable x-ray device in uh, the ambulance car. And it turned out that the portable x-ray device, all the um, images were stamped with the word portable. Um, now this is very interesting because <laughs> from the perspective of something that is just trying to learn any kind of pattern in the data that can improve predictive success, it turns out that if you have to be taken to the hospital in an ambulance, you are more likely to have pneumonia than if you walk in uh, of your own accord to the hospital and get a scan there. So the, the word portable is actually highly predictive of having pneumonia in these chest scans, but it's not the kind of feature that <laughs> we ideally wanted uh, our AI to be picking up on. And the reason is one, we already um, take into account the factors that uh, the difference in whether or not you're transported to the hospital is trying to pick up on. So uh, we're sort of double counting those factors if we also count, count the word portable. And um, this means that if you now take this device and move it to any kind of hospital that doesn't have the word portable on its scans, all of a sudden the performance that you thought you had is illusory. You're not getting that same good performance anymore. So we've learned this accidental pattern that doesn't generalize beyond our training data. And this is a big problem uh, for any kind of case where the training data is different from the data in the context of application. Why does this matter for issues of uh, generalization and racial disparity in medicine? Well, one of the reasons is that, again, I truly apologize, in the US, <laughs> um, patient cohorts uh, used for training clinical machine learning algorithms um, are highly concentrated in only three to five states. So if you look at this map, you can see um, there are only one state with 22 studies, namely California, two states with 14 to 15 studies, namely New York and Massachusetts, uh, one, no, three states with four to five studies, and then all the other states either have one to two studies or no studies. So this is not too surprising from a sociological point of view, right? California, New York, and Massachusetts are very rich. They have a concentration of uh, fancy, well-resourced hospitals like Brigham and Women's, Mass General, university hospitals. Um, they are the hospitals that are doing these kinds of clinical machine learning development. They're training it on their own uh, patient population because that's what they have access to. But it means we should expect that when we're taking these algorithms and we're moving them out of you know, exactly predicting um, Brigham and Women's rich hospital inner city uh, patients success to a rural setting, to a setting in a different state, um, we should expect the performance could degrade quite, quite rapidly. Um, and thinking about racial disparities, uh, if you recall the map I just showed you, and you compare that with the percentage of African-American citizens in each state, um, it's almost the inverse. The only state that has a large African-American population and some machine learning trials is Maryland. Um, but the heaviest concentration of African-American patients is going to be in the U.S. South, uh, where there were no machine learning trials whatsoever. So um, if we need a large, if, as we learned from ImageNet, we need a large enough population uh, in order to get certain kinds of performance, we are not getting that just based on these geographic disparities. So why does this lack of data matter? So if there's a clinically meaningful statistical generalization that's based on race, it's likely to be quite subtle. Um, and so if we have this, this huge data disparity between the two groups, uh, lack of data might mean that the performance on the minority group prediction would be worse if the two are separated. Uh, even worse than that, a recent study of health risk indicators showed that if we try to apply some of these traditional fair machine learning techniques um, to achieve demographic parity, to equalize odds, to equalize opportunity, um, the performance for all groups actually degrades. So um, we're not even 
helping the groups that we are trying to equalize. We're making their um, clinical outcomes and performance worse. Okay, so we have this question that, that I've just started to get to is, will awareness or sort of this active reliance on racial categories to do generalization, statistical generalization, will that increase equity? So um, just to get back to this issue of, of how different do the groups have to be in order for this to be important, think about just a super simple uh, classifier. We have a bunch of data with two different properties and we're trying to put some kind of a, a line that's gonna separate the data with the different properties. So some kind of data sets or functions are just not separable. You can't really put a line through them. But let's think about a case where we have a majority group and a minority group. And this really just has to be majority and minority with respect to the data set we have, not with respect to distribution in the population at large. So imagine um, we're trying to separate dot cases from cross cases. So here we're just looking at the majority group. We wanna say, okay, um, in all of the, the dot cases, that's gonna mean um, it is indicated to call them back for further testing or something. And in all of the cross cases, it's not. So we wanna separate these two cases. Okay, but what if in the minority group, actually these two things are flipped, right? So you notice the dots are on the other side and the crosses uh, are on the wrong side. Not perfectly, but there's a significant difference. So now imagine we're looking at the population as a whole. Um, because there are more numerically more of the majority group, their, uh, their preference is gonna dominate the classifier. And so it's gonna make the line be such that more of their instances are classified correctly. So that's sort of the best use case for fairness through awareness is like, we really think that these two groups have a significantly different um, distribution and we need to treat them separately so that the distribution of the minority group data isn't completely drowned or swamped out by uh, the majority group. But what kind of thing does this fail to capture? So if we're relying on awareness and we're in the kind of situation that we have here where um, the minority group is much uh, less numerous in the data set, right? So we just have fewer of them um, just having fewer of them alone might make their performance worse. And then if a, a classifier is significantly less good at, let's say, identifying candidates for surgery in a minority group, again, minority relative to the data, the candidates that are accepted might then have worse outcomes, which could lead to future over or under diagnosis. And so this sort of quality of service disparity can then lead to an allocation disparity. Um, Dork et al. called this a self-fulfilling prophecy. So because we divided them, because we did this awareness technique, um, now we've sort of created the conditions for worse outcomes in the future. And this is especially likely to happen with overdiagnosis. Okay, so now let's think about, um, given some of these things that we've talked about, about uh, awareness and relying explicitly on these kind of statistical generalizations based on race, um, when is race the right category? So there are gonna be a lot of times when we're using sort of very large data sets that have lots of different features, lots of different um, kinds of data. Uh, we're trying to learn really subtle patterns. And so we've created this high dimensional space that uh, we're modeling as a surface and we're trying to figure out um, what are the points that we wanna be at. So one thing that we know about trying to audit for bias in these kinds of settings is that can be, it can be really difficult to audit for bias against subgroups. So um, it might be possible to uh, audit for bias focusing only on um, some kind of uh, federally protected category. So in the US, these are race, religion, national origin, age, sex, disability, veteran status, um, the ones that we most often audit for uh, in medical settings might be race, age, sex, um, maybe disability status. Um, but it might be the case 
that the the quality of service harms where uh, the outcome is is less good for a minority group might correlate, in fact, not with the group as a whole, but with some subset of the group or with some intersectional category. So um, not uh, black patients as a whole, but black women in particular, or maybe um, black women with yet a third feature. So some kind of combination of features might be actually uh, the category that is getting significantly worse outcomes. And so um, if we use race proper as the category, um, we might be degrading the performance of the algorithm for the people who are not in that intersectional category while not doing enough to help the people who are in the small subset category. So these kind of failure of service harms undercut the viability of stereotyping based on broad categories such as race for medical AI. Okay, so uh, I'm in my outline, we've talked about race-based statistical generalizations um, and thresholds and how they can be less predictive than using the kinds of causal factors uh, like hypertension for which race is sometimes thought to function as a, as a proxy. Um, machine learning can help us find those more predictive factors or you know, when we can't directly find the, the factor that makes sense um, clinically, they can help us find more relevant groups or subgroups that might be um, smaller than racial categories or just sort of cross-cutting um, that are more clinically relevant in, in terms of doing the things we might wanna do in our algorithm, whether that's uh, adding points to a score or whatever it is. So now in the second half of the talk, I'm gonna talk about um, machine learning risk and um, the balancing of competing risks. So this is based on joint work with Jonathan Birch, Abhinav Jha, and Anya Platinsky. So thanks to them for letting me incorporate some of our joint work into this talk. All right, so imagine now in the second half of the talk that we're thinking specifically about uh, a type of machine learning called probabilistic classifiers. So we have some kind of data, let's say it's a lung x-ray, and we wanna know what's the probability that it falls, that this patient's x-ray falls into a certain category. And so we're not gonna get yes or no, we're gonna get you know, a number, like it's 51% likely to be cancerous. So this is extremely common, right? Um, including in the uh, score that I showed you at the beginning, long before machine learning came onto the scene, uh, in the land before time in 2015, when all we had was algorithms. Uh, just joking, we've had algorithms for a long time. Okay, so we have this probabilistic classifier. Uh, it produces a probability for each possibility that you're asking it to consider. So maybe we're saying, okay, this is 51% likely to be cancerous, um, but maybe it's 25% likely, likely to be a, a benign tumor. Maybe it's, you know, 15% likely to be something else, it can give you kind of this, this breakdown of however many categories you're asking it to consider. Um, in a lot of cases, diagnostic AI, AI that's used for clinical decision support, will then apply a threshold in order to deliver some kind of a recommendation. So we might say, um, well, if it's 15%, if it's below 15% likely, that's below the threshold where we're even gonna test for this thing. Um, if it's above 85% likely, we feel confident enough that we're just gonna you know, start investigating a treatment plan and maybe somewhere in the middle, uh, we're gonna require more testing. But we have this question of where do we set these thresholds and when should we set automated thresholds? So in order to think about this, we have to balance uh, false positives and false negatives, right? So um, this is a very common thing in machine learning. It's sometimes called a confusion matrix. So we, we're trying to figure out um, how to classify something. And uh, ideally, we would have a true positive, which is that it really is that thing. And we've successfully classified it as that thing. Awesome. Um, sometimes we might have 
a false positive, which is that it is not that thing, but we have classified it as that thing. Uh, we could also imagine um, a true negative, which we would also be excited about. We have successfully identified that it's not this thing, et cetera. So there's this concept in, in uh, philosophy and philosophy of science and decision theory known as inductive risk. And the idea here is that when we're in these situations where we have uh, a probabilistic um, score, but then we have to sort of take action, um, we're gonna need to bring in values in order to figure out where to set the threshold um, in order to interpret that probabilistic uh, distribution into an action. So uh, Jeffrey in 1956 said, um, scientists in general should not be in the business of accepting or rejecting hypotheses, rather they should just assign probabilities or assign degrees of belief to them. So um, in our analogy, this is the uh, clinical device, this is the medical AI that's just sort of assigning probabilities or degrees of belief to the different outcomes um, without yet assigning any kind of threshold for action. Um, but then when we are trying to decide whether to accept or reject a scientific hypothesis, that has implications for practical action. And so we have to figure out um, the acceptance should depend in part on non-epistemic value judgments about the cost of errors. So uh, Gabrielle Johnson has a really great paper about um, values in AI based on some of the feminist work in this literature. Um, and one of the things we're gonna wanna look at here is uh, how do we set the threshold for false positives and false negatives? And how is that gonna depend on our judgments about whether false positives or false negatives are more cost costly or less desirable, et cetera. So we have to weigh the consequences of a false positive against the consequence of a false negative and figure out, you know, how do we use that to set the threshold? So of course, you know, we don't wanna miss anything clinically, but we also have, we know that we have an enormous problem of overtreatment and that overtreatment and false positives can lead to um, accidents in the hospital, uh, any kind of health outcome or complication that can come from surgery. Um, so we have to weigh the possible costs of being wrong in the, in the sense, being wrong comma false positive and being wrong comma false negative and, and missing the uh, condition itself. So threat, this kind of threshold setting, if we do it automatically, uh, it has an epistemic cost. It has a cost in terms of our ability to understand the decision space. So if we set the decision threshold within one of these black box systems, um, it's sometimes clinically preferred. So uh, I talk a lot to human computer interaction people and they're always saying, you know, make it simpler, just, just give people the answer or, you know, give people the answer with the option to go find more information if they want it, but, you know, put the answer in, in, in huge letters at the top. Um, so, Clinicians sometimes prefer it in human subject trials because it's seen as being simpler and more actionable. Uh, it's also seen as being a shield against lawsuits. So, you know, if the device told me that this was clinically recommended uh, and I concurred, that might be um, protective in some way. One issue, however, with automatic threshold setting is that if the uh, underlying value itself isn't shown, um, you're leaving information on the table. So you, you've boxed the thresholds into these coarse screen categories, and you might risk degrading the quality of token decision instances. Um, it also makes it harder for junior clinicians to develop their own clinical judgment and to practice sort of placing appropriate trust in the device and having more information that can allow them when to trust and when not to trust. Because as we've already seen, uh, these devices are, are far from perfect. But the thing I wanna focus on today is that in addition to the epistemic costs, threshold setting also has an ethical cost. Um, in clinical settings, we know that there isn't a one size fits all decision threshold. Uh, 
So I'm gonna argue that for patient autonomy, it's appropriate for the decision threshold to take into account values and attitudes towards risk of a particular patient. So how would this work? Imagine that you um, go into a clinical setting, um, you know that you're gonna be evaluated for a certain kind of condition, um, and the clinician, before giving you any kind of diagnostic information, um, sits down with you and interviews you or has you fill out a form and with the goal of trying to figure out for that particular condition, what would be the patient's valuing of a true positive, disvalue of a false positive, value of a true negative, disvalue of a false negative, um, attitude towards overdiagnosis and misdiagnosis, attitude towards overtreatment versus undertreatment, and expected value of additional years of life of varying quality. So that's a uh, one possible mechanism that would allow you to sort of build up a risk value profile for that patient. A second possibility is to ask the patient to engage in hypothetical gambles. So if I have any like hardcore decision theory people in the audience, you know, you, you, you're gonna be excited about this. Decision theory people love asking people to engage in fake gambles. But the idea here is uh, if you have two options, um, ask people to gamble between them. So say, I would rather risk surgical complications to treat a benign tumor than risk meeting a, uh, missing a cancerous tumor, or ideally much more fine grained information that um, shares more about sort of the risk of each of those things. So asking people to directly weigh different scenarios and how they would value one over the other. So for the sort of decision theory context on this, um, when we're thinking about simple decision theory, we think about it as the probability of an outcome occurring uh, times the value or utility of that outcome would give us the expected value. So if I think, um, as far as I know, the likelihood of finding ice cream in my freezer is extremely high. Let's say it's 99% unless one of my roommates stole it, very unlikely. Uh, but the freezer ice cream is not that good. I'm gonna give it a value of three. Uh, the value of ice cream from a truck or a van in the UK, I looked this up, the ice cream van, uh, let's say that's very high, that's nine, um, but the likelihood of an ice cream van driving by is very low. Let's say it's 0.3. So I can multiply those together and I can say overall, uh, where does this leave me? Um, it leaves me thinking that the ice cream van search, uh, sadly, is less likely to be uh, overall valuable than the freezer ice cream search, alas. So that's traditional decision theory, but in order to model the kind of decision theory we would need for um, the kind of risk value profile I'm suggesting, uh, instead, we wanna add a third factor, which is the uh, tolerance for risk. So again, we're asking people things like, how do you value the risk of a high chance of an acceptable outcome? So, you know, finding the ice cream in the freezer versus a low chance of a great outcome uh, versus a low chance of a devastatingly bad outcome. And the, the basic idea here is that people's tolerances for risk vary widely. Um, so some people are much more uh, genuinely fulfilled by taking a risk that they know is extremely unlikely to work out because they put so much value on the good outcome, but also uh, their disvalue for the fact of risk is lower. So just to walk you through a, a quick example of that, um, this is from a recent Pixar movie. Uh, the main character wants to become a professional jazz mu musician. So his value for that would be nine. Uh, it's very unlikely that he's gonna succeed. Let's say his probability of success is 0.3. So the expected value is gonna be 3.6. His mother is going to say, hey, you're a band teacher. You can keep being a band teacher. I know you don't like it. Maybe your value for that is three, 
but you're already doing it. So your probability of continuing to be successful at it is extremely high. So the expected value is still 3.6. Um, and so let's say the main character and his mother both completely agree on all of that. They agree on the value, they agree on the probability of success. They might still choose uh, if, if each of them had choice over the decision of which career path he pursues, uh, they might still choose a different option because their risk tolerances are different. So Laura Buchek argues that it's rational to make decisions based on this kind of risk-weighted expected utility, to take into account our tolerances for risk in addition to our values and our preferences. So in order to do this, clinical decision makers need to be provided either with the probabilistic outputs or else with an automated recommendation that takes into account both those probabilistic outputs and the patient's values and tolerances for risk. So imagine um, in a case of breast cancer screening, you have a mammogram, we do our, our nice automated radiology, we get this probabilistic likelihood, but then we have to produce a clinical decision. Um, we know that there are an enormous number of false positives in breast cancer screening. So if the patient can be uh, fully informed about the overall decision landscape, which is definitely a challenge, um, and I'm sure we will talk about that in the Q&A, uh, her values for um, the balance of false positive and false negative are valuable to take into account. Um, likewise, let's say we're trying to uh, diagnose cognitive motor dissociation. So uh, this is patients with unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, um, formerly known as, as a vegetative state, although that's not at all accurate. Um, many of these patients are not actually able to modify their brain activity in response to commands. So if you say, keep opening and closing your right hand, um, that is gonna uh, sometimes elicit a different brain activity from stop opening and closing your right hand, even though the right hand never moves. Um, this is called cognitive motor dissociation. And so in a recent study, uh, Klassen et al trained a classifier to look at the EEG and um, for each time period where the different commands were given, um, lump them together and compare them against the patient's own baseline. So uh, the training was not on um, brains in general because brains are just so different from each other. The training was on the patient's own normal uh, patterns of responsiveness or lack of responsiveness before anyone is talking to them. And then uh, you can see here the healthy control when asked to do this has the tan uh, level of response, the patients with CMD have the blue level of response, and the patients with no CMD have um, the black or gray level of response. So the idea here is um, there's some risk in figuring out, uh, was this actually an instance of response? Um, we're not quite sure. Is it, is it statistically different enough from the baseline that's going to depend on where we set this threshold in the same way that um, a diagnosis based on a scan might depend on where we set the threshold. So how do we incorporate patient values and risk profiles? Well, one way might be uh, we take, we just output the raw score, which is common. Um, and then the clinician could use verbal or written summary of the patient's values and risk profile to arrive at a recommendation. But another possibility, which is uh, not currently being done to my knowledge, is to incorporate um, the risk value profile into the second opinion. So rather than just giving sort of like a generic uh, second opinion in addition to that probabilistic number, the recommendation could incorporate the patient's own values and own tolerance for risk. So to bring it full circle, um, one of the reasons that this is 
uh, important to think about in the context of statistical generalizations is that there's a long tradition in bioethics of thinking about these values in the context of uh, whether or not they are going to be generalized across cultural attitudes. So um, think about issues in the disclosure of cancer. Um, there have been a bunch of studies that have looked at various cultural and ethnic groups and tried to figure out um, if someone has a serious diagnosis, um, do they value uh, transparency, truth-telling, disclosure? Um, do they value being told about it in as blunt terms as possible? Uh, or do they value um, something on a different axis, which is you know, the ability to maintain hope, which many people think is clinically valuable, the ability to um, have a hopeful attitude about your own uh, prognosis, such that you might be more likely to recover. So balancing those things is something that's sometimes thought of as um, culturally located. So there have been a, a bunch of you know, cultural preferences for receiving medical bad news. Um, but one of the things that's quite notable about these studies is that um, there's a huge amount of in-group disagreement about the preference, which is what you would expect, but also that race categories don't track these preferences very well at all. So um, if different uh, in the US Asian American immigrant groups are lumped together, uh, that's not gonna be very predictive because uh, actually recent Chinese American immigrants and Korean American immigrants might have quite different um, attitudes in some kind of statistical generalization. So rather than trying to form these kind of generalizations about people's values and what they might be, um, I'm proposing it's gonna be much better to just ask the patient and directly incorporate their risk value profile into automated diagnosis. So thanks very much. And I look forward to your questions, uh, both now and by email. Uh, please feel free to contact me at kcreel at stanford.edu. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for a, a very comprehensive talk, as well as 